Hi, good evening. Welcome to the ICA. I am uh, Rosalie. I'm one of the curators here. It's great to see so many of you here for the beginning of summer. Um, it's really, really a pleasure, of course, to be welcoming to the stage theorist and media activist Franco Biffo Berardi. Um, thank you and welcome back to the ICA. <laughs> We're really pleased to have you. Um, Franco's latest books in English are And Feminology of the End, Heroes, Mass Murder and Suicide, and The Uprising on Poetry and Finance. These have all been published by Verso, um, and it's his latest that I'm clutching here, Futurability, The Age of Impotence and the Horizon of Possibility that he is here to discuss this evening. Um, it's, of course, a very timely and uh, urgent work, not least the afterword, which is titled The Inconceivable, which I believe was written in January of this year, um, after, of course, Trump and Brexit happened. So we're really pleased that you can be here to speak through this book. Um, Franco will give us a little presentation, and then we're really pleased to have a response and um, a leading of the Q&A <laughs> session by artist and writer Susan Kelly. So thank you to Su uh, Susan for joining us. She is a senior lecturer in fine art critical theory at Goldsmiths College. Susan's research looks at relationships between art and micropolitics, technologies of the self, space and practices of organisation. She works with, um, both with various collectives and individually in time-based work, installation and through writing and events and has <laughs> exhibited internationally. So there will be a chance uh, to take questions from the audience. Please just uh, store them up and we'll come round with a mic at the end. But for now, please join me in a very, very, very warm welcome for Franco. Thank you. <coughs> thank you for coming here. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Um, well, uh, I'm I'm supposed to 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 give a presentation of this book. Uh, uh, this book is titled Futurability, and it's about uh, the age of impotence uh, and the horizon of possibility. Um, well, I started <coughs> writing this book um, in October 2015, when uh, the age uh, marked by, by Barack Obama, in a sense, uh, marked by many, many things, but particularly uh, identifiable in, in the in the person of Barack Obama, was coming uh, to a close, was uh, sort of uh, finishing, declining. Uh, and, uh, and at that point, um, I, 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 I tried to, to come to terms with, uh, with a deception, I must uh, be sincere. At the beginning, uh, I remember in 2008, 2009, uh, um, uh, at the beginning of the Obama, of the first mandate of uh, Obama, um, I wrote a text, uh, probably a little bit uh, um, euphoric, uh, saying, uh, Communism is back, uh, and we have to call it therapy of singularization. And it was dedicated to Barack Obama. And I said, uh, um, he does not know because he is not a communist, uh, but he will be obliged to, uh, to do what we, my generation, has not been able to do. Um, call it communism, call it uh, whatever you like. Uh, but uh, to do something good, and uh, uh, 2008, you remember, it was a, a, a moment of, uh, of panic, in a sense, uh, the financial crisis, uh, two wars, uh, tragically uh, unfolding, for the United States, uh, for the West uh, in general, uh, at that point, uh, for me, uh, the, the, the President of the United States was a sort of symbol of, uh, of, um, of something, of a new 
potency. And that actually came to the fore, you remember, saying those three strange words, yes, we can. Uh, when I heard this, those uh, words, I said myself, oh, oh, what you mean? You are the most powerful person in the most powerful uh, country ever. So, of course, you can. Uh, it's obvious. <coughs> but Obama is, is more smart than me, and he knew what he was doing. He knew the meaning of those three words. He knew that the American people really wanted to listen exactly to those three words. The American people wanted the American people, the, the, the people of the world, and particularly the Western uh, people, wanted to listen to someone uh, reassuring on this point. We are powerful, so we can. Eight years after, we have to, <laughs> to admit uh, that the exorcism has failed. It was not a promise. Uh, Obama was not promising something. He was making an exorcism. Uh, he was trying to do something that probably he intimate. I don't think that Obama will, will, uh, will be remembered as a great political person. I think that Obama will be remembered as an intellectual, as an intellectual person. He has had the ability to see something, to see the impotence. And uh, those three words were an exorcism that failed. Because eight years after that, uh, that declaration, we know that we cannot even close Guantanamo, you know? Small thing to do, impossible. So forget about uh, coming out from Afghanistan. In the newspapers, you don't read the word Afghanistan. It's sort of uh, unspeakable word. But Afghanistan, as the war in Afghanistan has never been as bloody as it is now. The most bloody a uh, murder, uh, a terrorist act in Afghanistan up, happened one month ago, 15 years after the beginning of a war that the criminal preceding Obama called the endless war. We cannot stop the war in Afghanistan and the Taliban now have more territory than they had in 2001. We cannot stop the war in Iraq, obviously. The war in Iraq has become not a war, but two, three, four, five, who knows how many. We cannot rein in on, the, on Wall Street, on, on, on the financial uh, uh, system, forget about it. We cannot make a, a, a reform of the, of the health uh, uh, care, because uh, Obama tried, uh, he did something, not really <laughs> a reform, an attempt to, to start. And, and as you know now, someone is cancelling <coughs> that attempt. We can do nothing. That is the truth nowadays. And this is my starting point. The political will is impotent. But what is the political will? So I, start, uh, I started the writing this book thinking, one, to the end of the, the Obama administration, second, to the end of the political wisdom of the modern world, uh, and particularly to Niccolò Machiavelli. Niccolò Machiavelli <laughs> is, uh, was a, a guy who knew a lot about uh, power and potency. And what did he say about that? Take, uh, take his most famous book, The Prince. Read at the chapter 25 of that book. And you 
will read the best definition of political power that I, that I can find in, in the universal bibliography, says the prince, the power, power is the force able to submit fortuna. Fortuna is a Latin word meaning the, the unpredictability of nature, the unpredictability of uh, uh, the human events. And uh, the prince is the male, the masculine force, uh, which is able to submit the feminine capricious fortuna. He says, Machiavelli, he says the prince has to beat and to submit fortuna, because fortuna is a female. So he, she is capricious. And power, you see that uh, the history of uh, modern political power is uh, well sketched in the words of Machiavelli. The masculine ability to submit the infinite capricious uh, uh, possibility of nature. This is uh, power for Machiavelli. And, uh, and this was, has been possible. I mean, for two, three, four centuries, actually, the masculine power of, uh, of politics has been able to submit nature, to submit uh, human events, to submit time, labor, and so on. But you know, for, for, for this uh, uh, um, submission, for this subjection uh, become um, actual, uh, a, 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 a sort of drastic reduction was necessary. That reduction was possible in the age of, uh, uh, that we call the age of modernity, the, the reduction of, uh, of possibility to the determination of the human reason, to the mm, determination of uh, the cognitive reduction. But you know, it's, uh, it's a problem of, um, uh, of, um, of relation between uh, the time of political decision and the temporality of the event. It's a problem of time. Modern age and modern power was based on a special organization of the relation between the time of decision and the time necessary to elaborate the existing available information. The rhythm of information in the age of printed alphabetical communication was reductible, reducible to the time of the conscious political decision. At a certain point, uh, at the end of modernity, the rhythm, the velocity, the speed of uh, uh, events, uh, and particularly of information about events, started to accelerate and accelerate and accelerate, <laughs> up to a point that the time for political decision came to its end. At a certain point, the potency which is based on the ability of finding the relevant thing and to submit the infinite capricious multiplicity of events to the decision about the relevant thing, this, this relationship became, came out of, uh, of its, uh, its uh, uh, framework. And uh, the, the acceleration of the world came out of the ability to elaborate, to understand, to decide decision. The critical decision, you know, also the concept of critique 
is um, belongs to the same uh, problematic field. What is the critical decision? What is critique? What is the meaning of the word critique? Critique is the ability to discriminate between true and false. The ability to discriminate about uh, between good and bad. This uh, ability to discriminate is based on the temporality of our brain and the temporality of the chaotic universe. The more the relevant universe, of course, you can tell me that always the world has been much more complicated than the ability of understanding the stars in the sky. How can you decide about the number of the uh, stars in the sky? But we don't care about the number of, of, of stars in the sky. We care about the relevant information in the social dimension. Power is based on the control, the knowledge, the critique, the decision on that sphere. Well, impotence is the inability to decide and to critically determine uh, the, the between good and bad. The, so my, the starting point of my book is uh, this uh, uh, constatation. Can you say constatation in English? This uh, observation, this understanding. No way we can no more decide in time. This is why political power is over. So what happens? So what becomes the new form of the social, of the social um, organization? And in a sense, uh, when, when, when the ability to, to decide in a critical and political way, when, when, when this happens, at that point, uh, uh, only war uh, is able to 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 uh, uh, to discriminate. It's the, the the kingdom of permanent chaos and of permanent uh, of permanent war uh, on one side. So, if we look at the present uh, condition of the, of the world, uh, we are uh, obliged to, to recognize that war is spreading uh, everywhere. A sort of uh, global civil war is spreading uh, around. Um, I, I was persuaded, and, and I speak about that in, in my book, I was persuaded that, uh, uh, that uh, um, the coming war, the war, the present war, uh, will never really resemble to the um, world war of the past century, because you cannot uh, find a, a front. You cannot find uh, two different uh, alliances fighting each other. If you look in, at Mosul, at uh, Alep, Aleppo, if you look in, in everywhere, you don't see two fronts fighting each other. You, you see a fragmentation of, uh, of uh, micro uh, fronts, uh, war has been privatized in the last 40 years. One, the last uh, and the most uh, criminal effect of the neoliberal process of privatization of everything is the privatization of weapons, is the privatization of, uh, of, um, of uh, war. So, in a sense, we have the impression that, uh, that uh, there is no more control. And also, let's look at the, the, the present condition of the United States as a political country. The impression is that, that, uh, that uh, uh, the, the American state is over, is exploded. It's going towards a sort uh, of uh, a crazy civil war. Um, civil war uh, is the technical definition of what is happening. I mean, when the FBI, the CIA fight against uh, the White House and the White House is broken into parts, uh, and uh, when uh, uh, six 15,000 local public institutions declare to be sanctuaries uh, that want to, to transgress uh, the law. Well, when you 
are in a situation like that. I, I call it technically double power or technically civil war. So have we entered the age of permanent chaos? Yes and not. Because at the same time, I, yes, I, I, I think, uh, frankly speaking, that the, the American political uh, uh, state uh, is over, uh, not to mention the European, and not blah, 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 blah. Uh, but at the same time, I see that when I use the word America, I am not speaking only of a nation of a political country. I am talking of a frontier, of a tendency, a trend, tendency to continuously overcome the limit and to continuously expand the, the, the dimension of control. So now I would say that the puritanical reality that is called America is not only the United States of America, is, only, is also and mainly the Silicon Valley. So we have two different forms of power nowadays. On one side, we have uh, the political power that is falling apart. And at the same time, you have another form of power which is essentially a cognitive power, which is essentially a technical power and neural power that is growing more and more strong, more and more pervasive, more and more inevitable. The last book of uh, um, Kevin Kelly, the, a, an interesting Californian writer who, who um, I came to know 25 years ago when he published a beautiful book titled um, Out of Control, uh, which was about the rise of, of the, of the um, global mind. Um, uh, now, Kevin Kelly has published a book that is titled The Ine An Inevitable. Inevitable, unavoidable. Um, and the inevitable, according to Kelly, is uh, the growing domination of the technical power on uh, our life, on our mind. Kelly is uh, happy of this. He is a sort of uh, a totalitarian Buddhist. Uh, when he <laughs> says, uh, um, yeah, I, I, I cannot understand uh, Kelly, which I like, frankly. I cannot understand his books uh, if I don't think that he is simultaneously a, a Californian Buddhist and a Californian neurototalitarian. But uh, you see, this uh, junction of, um, of uh, global mind and inevitability of the technical uh, uh, entanglement of, uh, of the, 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 the world uh, and of uh, the, the global brain, this kind of inevitability is only partially persuading because I remember, I always remember a sentence. I don't remember the order of this sentence, probably it's me. A, a sentence uh, that sounds like this, the unavoidable never happens because the unpredictable always wins. So I am waiting for the uh, unpredictable. And where is the unpredictable? Well, my book is, is, a, is not... Uh, um, it's not, uh, non è allegro, how can I say it? It's not um, merry. Um, uh, um, I start from the, the understanding that a new form of uh, totalitarian power is rising. But at the same time, my book is about, uh, is a book in spite of in spite of the present, in, in spite of the unavoidable, uh, unavoidable in, in spite of the predictable, in spite of the evident, in spite of the war, in spite of uh, the present depression. Because uh, 
I, I see that impotence is the prevailing trend of our time. But at the same time, I see that the possibility has never been cancelled. So, what is the possibility? Well, let's say that mm, what is interesting to me is uh, to work uh, on three, three different concepts. One is the concept of uh, impotence. And the concept of impotence is uh, uh, giving me the possibility of describing uh, the present, uh, of describing, of understanding why Donald Trump won the elections in the United States of America, and uh, Nigel Farage uh, won the referendum in the United Kingdom, and why fascists are uh, growing and growing everywhere in the world. The, this is the victory of the impotence. The impotent of the world need someone representing their longing for a past potency, a fake potency, the potency of, uh, uh, of people uh, who, are, uh, who are simply able to represent, uh, to identify the humiliation of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, the, of the impotence, of the political impotence, of the sexual impotence, of the psychological impotence of the white race in the world. So it's about impotence, but it's also about the possibility. And what is the possibility? The possibility is the growing force of knowledge. You know, during the last century, the most uh, important thing has been the continuous increase, the continuous uh, emergence of uh, knowledge as uh, force for the, uh, for the transformation of life and for the replacement of uh, uh, labor with activity. Essentially, I think that uh, when we speak uh, of, uh, of um, technology and of the force of technology, we are, spe we are speaking of something very ambiguous because technology is a tool for the control, for the submission of our time, but at the same time, technology is a tool for the liberation of our time and of our uh, activity. But this ambiguity is not a misunderstanding. This ambiguity is deeply inscribed in the form of technology and of knowledge itself. And so the possibility is there, but we are unable to unfold this possibility. Why so? So we need a third concept referring to futurability. Impotence is the present situation, but impotence is uh, a, 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 the inability to, to see that the possibility is there. The possibility of liberation is here, is in the present, is in my, in my brain, is in our brain, is in the living brain of hundred million of cognitive workers in the world, the possibility is there. So why hundred million cognitarians in the world are unable to unfold the possibility that, uh, that uh, is inscribed in their life, in their brain, in their... Because the third person is power. What is power? And uh, so I try to elaborate about the concept of power. And I, s and I think that we can define power as a machine for invisibilization. Power is uh, in, an organization of our vision in such a way that we can see something, but we are forbidden, unable to see something else. The very epistemological organization of our life, of our time, of our uh, social relation, of our knowledge, is made in such a way that it is making impossible to see 
something that is inscribed in the present uh, and um, what exactly is inscribed in the present. Sometimes I think that Michel Foucault has forgotten to write his most important book, which in my opinion is a book about uh, the genealogy of salaried labor. Then I have a second thought and I understand that Michel Foucault uh, has written <laughs> only about that, uh, when he speaks about uh, the, the prison, when he speaks about the school, when he speaks about sexuality, when he speaks about this, the, the city, he is speaking about salaried labor. He is speaking about uh, the inability of the modern mind to see the possibility of uh, emancipation from salary. Salary is the crucial uh, point, it is the superstition that makes impossible to see the possibility of getting free from labor. And uh, you know when I say salary, I say uh, the, the, the idea, the superstition actually, uh, that uh, if you want to survive, you have to give me your time and I give you a salary. Maybe that it was true 500 years ago, or maybe also 100 years ago, but it's no more true. The contrary is true. The more we uh, insist in the idea that if you want to survive, you have to work, the more we will we'll be unemployed, precarious, poor, marginalized, rabious, impotent, defeated, humiliated. Because, because I mean, working less, drastically less, is not only possible, but necessary. Larry Page, uh, who knows more than me about the subject, uh, in an interview published by Computer World two years ago, said, I don't understand how it's possible that the governments of the world uh, uh, repeat the mantra of full employment. It's impossible, full employment. Uh, if, uh, if people who are working eight hours per day, uh, six days for week per week, and uh, all day lifelong, it's impossible. Because if Google puts the, the, the uh, artificial intelligence that we have already here in our computers in the process of production tomorrow morning, 50% of the existing jobs will disappear. So how can you uh, expect uh, full employment? Uh, you know, when Larry Page says this, uh, um, he is referring to the possibility of disentangling knowledge from the superstition of salaried labor. I know Larry Page is part of the problem, but in his mind, he also has the solution. But he will not develop the solution. We, the communitarians of the world have to develop the solution that is entangled in the capitalist machine. So my impression is that uh, the problem of um, uh, the political problem of our future is essentially disentangling the possibility from the tangle of uh, Power from the tangle that makes impossible to see the possibility itself. Impotence is based on this entanglement. So we we can expect a good uh, a good solution of the tragedy. Well, I'm not sure of that because uh, the, 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 the real game is starting now. And uh, I know that uh, in the present, uh, in the present life and in the present knowledge uh, is uh, inscribed the possibility, a possibility, many possibilities. The possibility is not infinite. But the possibility is not one. The possibility is many, is plural. 
And uh, we don't see the plurality of possibility because we are entangled by the superstition of uh, salaried labor. Getting free from this superstition uh, implies uh, a political and cultural and imaginary force that at the moment uh, is lacking. That is the point. We don't <coughs> have the imagination and the, the, the political force to disentangle the possibility. So war is spreading all over. Uh, do you think that we can avoid the unfolding of the, of the trauma? I don't think so. Frankly speaking, I think that we have entered into a dark age and that we have to go through this uh, dark age. But the problem is also that we have to keep the consciousness that uh, during this passage, which is unavoidable because it's here, during this dark passage, we have to, to, to repeat <laughs> that the possibility is here. The possibility is in the solidarity among 100 million of cognitive workers. Solidarity, <laughs> not, uh, not, an easy, not an easy word, because solidarity, empathy, friendship, this is, uh, this is what we do not have. We do not have uh, uh, these for reasons that belong, uh, uh, first of all, belong to, to the organization of labor, uh, belong to the precarization of life, uh, and belongs to the, to the um, connectivization of uh, uh, our communication, of our uh, of our linguistic relation, the transformation of language into a, a system of techno-linguistic automatism is uh, uh, impeaching us from, 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 from developing a, a, a concrete solidarity. And uh, so in a sense, uh, I think that uh, the, the, the the political problem of the, of the next uh, age uh, is disentangling uh, the intellectual energies of the Conitarian force uh, from the trap, uh, from the trap, from the tangle of, uh, of salary labor during the trauma. And uh, if I try to find uh, some conceptual tool for better understanding and better developing this, uh, this idea, I, I refer to, to a, a French uh, philosopher whose name is Catherine Malabou. Uh, Malabou, in my opinion, uh, as, uh, as uh, you know, Catherine Malabou is the author of books like uh, What Should We Do uh, uh, With Our Brain? or the new wanted, uh, and so on. I, 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 I like her books because she is uh, speaking uh, simultaneously of the problem of therapy, of psychotherapy nowadays, and of neurology at the same time. Uh, you remember that guy called Sigmund Freud. Uh, his essential uh, act was displacing the problem of suffering and the problem of uh, therapy from the field of neurology to the field of sex and language. A brilliant move. And for 100 years, it has been useful, sometimes effective, and always interesting from the intellectual point of view. But now, 
Try to explain Alzheimer in terms of sex and language. Try to explain uh, Parkinson, but also try to explain panic crisis and also try to explain massive depression in terms of sex and language. Sex and language have something to do, but in my opinion, the real problem is uh, a neurological trauma that is uh, is uh, develop is deploying uh, in the depth in the deep dimension of the global brain. Global brain uh, is no more a metaphor. Global brain is becoming uh, something uh, something true. It's here. It's in the connection of hundred million cognitive workers. The global brain of 100 million cognitive workers uh, is uh, the political, but also the therapeutic, but also, in a sense, uh, the, the, mm, the philosophical problem of, uh, um, of, um, of our time. We have to focus on the possibility of, the, of disentangling the possibility the, 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 the possibilities of the global brain from this, uh, from this uh, tangle, which is, uh, which is the, 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 the form of salaried labor. In order to do that, I think that we have to talk uh, about the, the neurological dimension of our time. And when we, we see what's happening, what is coming from, from the Silicon Valley machine, what is coming from the big corporation of the global brain, we see that, uh, that it's a sort of uh, neurological domination. Uh, I call it neurototalitarianism. And uh, disentangling the possibility from the neurototalitarian form of capitalism is, in my opinion, the philosophical and political problem that we are facing now. Thank you for your attention and, uh, well, bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, in the introduction to Bifo's book, he said, I will not write another book about the future, <laughs> but I did. Um, <laughs> and I'm glad that you did, because I think it's, it's actually slightly less dark, I would say, than the hero's book, um, which was the last time I heard you speak. Um, so I'm not going to talk for too long. I suppose just a couple of, of points that I wanted to pull out of, of the book that I've had a bit of a turbo read of, I have to say, um, and it connects in some ways to what, you've, what you're talking about now. Um, I suppose the first thing I wanted to <coughs> bring up was this question of knowledge and the relationship to consciousness. Um, so you're talking about how we have to keep our consciousness and you talk about the problem of the conscious decision. Um, and in the book, uh, near the start of the book, you quote um, Iggy Pop lyrics from This Is A Film. I don't know if people remember that song. Um, and it says, the man thinks, the horse thinks, the sheep thinks, the cow thinks, the dog thinks, but the fish doesn't think. The fish is mute, expressionless. The fish doesn't think because the fish knows everything. <laughs> okay, I love this lyric. Um, <laughs> so I wondered, I wondered, I guess, why you put those lyrics in there. And I wanted to think about the fish <laughs> in relationship to uh, knowledge and consciousness. Um, so, you know, how do we hear the fish? How do we know that he knows? Um, how do we know that he knows anything at all? And so it made me think of this question of consciousness that comes up over, over and over again in the book. Um, and it's a funny kind of old-fashioned word, consciousness, in, in a lot of ways. Um, and I don't think you mean it in the sense of you know, Lukács or Lenin necessarily, the, you know, that the intellectuals or the activists need to bring consciousness to the cognitarians or, you know, I don't think that's, that's what you mean. Or that it's some kind of truth, you know, that there's a truth of 
neuro-totalitarianism that needs to be uncovered somehow. Um, but I was thinking, I guess, more about this idea of conscious decisions and where that consciousness comes from and thinking about the, the sort of um, uh, new interest and the kind of revisitation of practices of consciousness raising, I guess, from the feminist movement um, that our friend Mark Fisher got quite interested in and you wrote that beautiful tribute to him. Thank you for that. Um, and groups such as Plan C have been, have been using to try and think about this neural body somehow. You know, how do we create friendship, solidarity, community? How do we slow down and think about tacit or invisible knowledge? You know, so the, the mute fish I'm thinking about here. So the sort of tacit knowledge or the in intuition maybe is another word um, that feminists have used too. So how do, we, how do we bring that knowledge out and create communities of, of new consciousness around that and how, how that might be a practice? Um, to counter some of this stuff. Um, I have a couple of other points to make. Uh, do you want to respond to that one first, or should I carry on? Carry on. Okay. Um, okay, so that's the fish question. Um, um, yeah, and then I guess, you know, I wanted to hear a little bit more about automation as well, and in the, in the last um, section of the book, and this evening you've talked about how possibility still lies in the structural constitution of the present world. Um, so emancipation, enrichment, peace. Um, and he said that this becomes possible through the cooperation of these knowledge workers and also the liberation of human time from labor, which will mostly be replaced by technology. Um, so you say that this energy then can be moved to the fields of education, of self-care and of care. Um, and I was curious to hear um, care in there, and I wondered if you understood care as labor. Um, and I wondered if you could comment um, on some of the critiques of, of automation in a way so that, you know, somebody still, a machine can't do the caring. You talk about aging quite a lot in the book as well. So I wondered if you could sort of think about automation in relation to the question of, of, of aging and care. Um, so that was my automation question. Um, and then I guess the last, last question um, is not necessarily a question, but I've always really appreciated how open you are about the, the kind of highs and lows of political engagement and you know, the moments where you think Obama's going to do it or the student movement's going to do it, and you get very caught up in the, in the enthusiasm and the optimism of moments, and then the crash <laughs> that comes after. Um, and I, I think that openness is, is really good to be, um, ha to have out there so that you're not in this sort of constant cynical um, position of the critic on the outside that knew it was all going to go bust anyway. Um, but I guess I wonder if this despair is a luxury we can afford <laughs> right now. Um, I mean, I agree with your analysis you know, sort of post-democracy after Iraq, after Greece, um, after all the ruptures of the last year. Um, you know, I agree with the analysis around post-democracy that are around right now. I agree with the, the there's a small criticism in the book of um, Alex Williams and Nick Cernasek's demands that, you know, that kind of go into the ether. Who are you demanding full automation of? Who are you demanding universal income from? You know, and um, that this, there is no structure to demand that of because democracy is dead, okay? <laughs> but then I'm also thinking of Ada Kalau, I'm thinking of the 15M movement, um, and I'm also thinking a little bit about the people who are calling for a, a new rise in left populism. Um, and I'm just really curious to hear what, what you think about that, you know, sort of populism toward progressive ends, or is this part of the dead project of democracy? That's all I have to say. Okay. So would you like to respond to some of that now, or do you want to accumulate some more questions? <laughs> or is that enough? <laughs> oh, well, you, need, you need your mic. I will, I will, um, yeah. As you 
uh, has um, pointed out two points that I consider very important. Uh, I will try to, to deal with uh, those points. The first automation is a crucial uh, concept in this book, but generally I think in the, in the present uh, situation, automation is a, uh, is a, is a word uh, absolutely ambiguous in my, in, my, in my view. On one side, uh, automation is the, the, the effect of the, the good effect, the positive effect of the conjunction of the meeting of labor and knowledge. In, in the fragment of machine, second volume of Grundris, Marx speaks of automation. He does not use this word, but it's all about automation and he says, I don't know anything about communism, the future. I am not writing recipes for the restaurant of the future. But I know that the more knowledge enters in the social process, the less we need work. So the more we will be free from uh, the obligation of work. So automation is a good thing, but at the same time, I see that automation is acting as a sort of uh, depotentialization of, uh, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, of the social um, uh, force. Automation is automation of language, automation of will, automation of desire, uh, uh, is uh, disempowerment of the political uh, force. So, so we have to disentangle automation from automation itself. The only possibility of uh, unfolding the uh, possibility of replacing labor with knowledge, with automation, is the automating our consciousness, our language, second shortly populism. It's a word that I don't use, and frankly speaking, I propose that we cancel that word. It means nothing. When I meet a fascist, I say fascist. When I meet a racist, I say racist. I don't say populist. So I don't understand how is it possible to think about a left uh, a, a leftist face of fascism. No way. It means nothing. Uh, I, and also, you know, what is generally called populism is actually an effect, an aggressive effect of impotence. And I prefer to to, to, to face a reality of impotence and to say to the fascist, I understand you, poor guy. You are impotent, like me. But you see, I'm happy. You are not. So you vote for Donald Trump. I do not propose to create a, a, a leftist party of uh, the unhappy, uh, impotent, uh, who want to aggress someone in order to feel some potency that they had lost. I call it uh, communism the possibility of coming out uh, from fascism, not left populism. That's really helpful, I agree. <laughs> or I call it in a new way, mm -hmm. maybe that mm -hmm. communism is an old word, mm -hmm. but also Christianism is an old word, uh, but I, I know a guy who is called Francesco, uh, who is giving a new meaning to the word Christianism. The message of Francis in your book. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Great, okay. So I can start taking questions. Do a big wave if you have a question so I can see the lights are super bright up here. Mm -hmm. Head scratching or arm moving. I can't tell, okay, the back left, yeah. Nope.
Okay. 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 Three times lucky. Um, <laughs> hello. So um, I want you to elaborate maybe on the um, theme of care and because you talk about community and communism and what does community actually mean and what, uh, how, can we, how can we bring, because I, I feel that in the political speech care is really missing and if, it, if, there, if it's there it's really just superficial and it's some, just something that politicians use to gain some 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 popularity but the the real care but amongst maybe us how can we bring that into the into um to the future and also maybe an idea of empathy so because empathy is not such a such a um, it's quite a, a young term actually and and uh, and and so so how does empathy fall into politics and into the future and into the potency of of uh, our communities. Thank you. What should I do? Answer or wait? No, I, I try to to go for, to go fast. Um, um, I I I think um, that large part of our political impotence uh, is based is uh, uh, yes is uh, provoked by a sort of desensibilization of the social uh, of the social uh, mind let's call it an empathy and uh, how did it happen how uh, you see that in, in the last decades, the decades uh, of the neoliberal uh, uh, transformation and of the simultaneous creation of the, uh, of the digital network, um, the, 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 the sensibility has uh, uh, undergone a sort of uh, mutation. In a sense, uh, sensibility has sort of disappeared, of faded. What is sensibility? Sensibility, in my parlance, uh, is the ability to understand what cannot be translated into verbal language. Sensibility is the ability to understand meaning without the mediation of digits of words of uh, uh, you see so sensibility is the social uh, condition of empathy reactivating empathy is um, is first of all a problem of um, of uh, care of therapeutic uh, action but also it's a problem of um, um, of um, overcoming the effects of a digitalization of, uh, of communication on one side and of competition in the field of, uh, of labor, in the field of... Uh, when, when we speak of precarious labor, of precarization, in my opinion, we are essentially speaking of something that is not only juridical uh, and so on but is essentially technical and psychological precarization is the transformation of the human communication of the communication among workers into something that is reduced to recombinable bits to recombinable uh, units um, so Precarity is simultaneously desensibilization of uh, social communication 
and competition everywhere. Competition means war, in a sense or another, and certainly means this empathy, reactivation of empathy. This is the problem of therapy nowadays. And politics now is, uh, is first of all, is reactivation of empathy. How can you do that? Uh, that's the problem. And in my opinion, it's much more a problem for artists, uh, for poets, uh, then a problem for uh, doctors. Uh, or it's a problem for doctors and for artists. Uh, when I say artist, I mean uh, those people uh, who, who search for meaning uh, in a field that is not a connective field. I, when I say poet, uh, I mean uh, those people uh, who search for meaning uh, as uh, we understand that, uh, that uh, meaning is, is vibrational, not syntactical. An empathy is the syntactization of communication. We have to reactivate the vibra vibrational search uh, for meaning. Uh, it's a problem of that goes beyond uh, the old separation between politics and psychoanalysis. Uh, 100 years ago, 50 years ago, we are talking all the time of Marx and Freud, the psychoanalysis and politics. That problem is over because there is no more psychoanalysis, there is no more politics. The only politics uh, that I know is reactivation of empathy. And the conditions that would bring that about, presumably. Yeah, of course. Right. Yeah. Okay. Is a question there? I just uh, that provokes a thought about the owner of empathy and the liberal. You know, the empathy is uh, not really that recent a notion. Someone's going to own it and interpret it. Um, and there's a question of the misuse and displacement of empathy into forms of oppression that's quite old. Uh, so I guess my question is about the Buddhist fascist possibilities of empathy. And those seem to have disappeared in your last contribution. If I claim to empathize with you in one sense, I'm telling you what's good for you. And um, so it seems to collapse into questions of how we communicate authentically and all of the disciplinary regress that we're trying to escape, if that makes sense. So I would be, in a sense, have a certain red light about that category, the category of empathy. Well, I know you are pointing uh, the finger on, uh, on the, the, the most painful uh, uh, problem uh, and uh, frankly speaking uh, I have not an answer to the problem of how to reactivate uh, empathy. I, I go back to Catherine Malabou and Catherine Malabou speaks of trauma. So you know what I mean when I speak of trauma. I refer for instance I refer to an article of Zbigniew Brzezinski that I read some months ago. Zbigniew Brzezinski is not a, a, a radical thinker. He used to be the secretary of state in the administration in the Carter administration. He is one of the, the most uh, important uh, intellectuals of the American establishment. He's a man of power for sure. But uh, one year ago, he published uh, an article in the magazine uh, The American Interest. The title of the article is Toward the Global Realignment. Uh, the title is flavorless, uh, but the article is really, really impressive. He says, Daesh, the Islamic uh, State, is probably the beginning of uh, the, the, the coming war. Because uh, after 500 years uh, of uh, exploitation, humiliation, oppression, violence, colonial violence, uh, uh, now the, the, the oppressed people 
uh, have the ability to fight. And uh, they fight in a very nasty way. They have the possibility of, uh, um, thanks to the privatization of uh, weapons, they have the ability to, to build an atomic bomb, a small nuclear bomb, uh, which is enough to make, uh, to, to be dangerous. And so you see, we are facing now the effect of 500 years of uh, violence. And Brzezinski says uh, the, the effects of colonization will last for, for the next, uh, during the next century and will mark. Uh, so this is the trauma that I am talking about. This is a trauma that is making it very, very hard to find a way for, for empathy. But at the same time, I know that the only way to imagine good life at the individual level, at the level of small community, the only way to imagine a good life is forgetting about uh, the trauma, living the trauma, but simultaneously forgetting about the effects uh, of it and rebuilding the possibility of friendship starting from your personal and collective life, from the small environment in which we, you live. But you, like me, we are first of all part of the body of the Conitarian uh, labor in the world. I have this obsession that, uh, I say, 100 million Conitarians. I don't know. They are probably much less or much more. I don't <laughs> care. Just I want to say a huge body. <laughs> but the, the body is nowhere. The brain is active because we are producing everything. Our brain is producing everything. But our body is nowhere. So the general intellect is looking for a body. This is my strategy. But uh, I am also looking for a therapy because this strategy needs a therapy. The therapy is now. The strategy is the next uh, 50 years, maybe. The, the, the therapy is the condition of reactivation of friendship at some level, at a small level. But you know, friendship is contagious. The ability to think that friendship is the condition of, uh, of, of, uh, of the creation, uh, uh, of, uh, of the recognition of the body of the general intellect. This is the way that uh, I, I see for the connection of therapy now for a strategy. In, in our future. Then I know we need a doctor. <laughs> Do you want to come back on that or can I move on to the next question? Okay. Um, okay, so the back and then here. So over here first, maybe. Hi. Um, I'm very interested in what you have to say about poetry um, as a contrasting form to other forms of language and how you use this as a metaphor to talk about many other things in the situation. Uh, and you touched upon a bit on poetry um, back then for the other question, but you also mentioned art, but didn't elaborate on it that much. If you have any more to say about how art plays a role in this uh, resensitization and giving the a uh, very abstract collective mind, a, a body, and about therapy, if you could elaborate a bit more on the art, the role it plays there. Well, when, when I try to, to translate uh, my confused uh, vision of the futurability, I identify some metaphorical figures, some, uh, uh, yes, some metaphors. And the, the, the metaphorical figures that I see uh, in, in, uh, in the present landscape are essentially uh, the poet, the engineer, and the economist, and probably the designer as a mediator uh, among them. Who is the, who is the, 
the engineer and who is the poet. Um, the poet for me, or the artist, as you prefer, or the scientist, to, I do not distinguish at this metaphorical level, the poet, the artist, the scientist are, are intellectual people uh, who search for meaning in a vibrational way. That means uh, that they, identif they do not identify truth uh, or meaning uh, as uh, the effect of a syntactic combination of, uh, of the semiotic process. They look, they search for a possible meaning in the conjunction between, between uh, bodies, between minds. Then comes the engineer, who on the contrary is uh, reducing knowledge and reducing meaning to the connective form, to the syntactic relation between science. Then comes the economist. You know, the poet uh, and the engineer uh, might be friends. They could talk uh, each other. And uh, actually, at the beginning of the modern uh, times, in the uh, age of the humanist renaissance, uh, there is a good humanism, not only Machiavelli, there is another guy called Pico della Mirandola and many others like him who imagined the possibility of uh, an alliance between the poet and the engineer. So the poet uh, is uh, opening a possibility uh, of meaning and the engineer is creating machines for the fixation and the, the technical actualization of meaning. But the, the economist uh, is coming there uh, as a sort uh, of um, sort of dogmatic person uh, who is not uh, searching for meaning but is uh, uh, imposing meaning. I don't think that economics is a science. I think that economics is essentially a technology for the imposition of a dogma, the dogma of growth, the dogma of accumulation, the dogma of profit, the dogma of salary and labor, and so on and so on. So they go around uh, 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 telling uh, people uh, you have to repent for your sins, uh, for your debts, uh, and so on. And the economist is the person who is the metaphorical person, of course. Uh, uh, the economists uh, have not to... to, to um, uh, I mean, I, I forget. Please uh, forgive. The economists, uh, forgive me. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I mean the economic, the, 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 the economical function is essentially fixation of the, the of the of the social relation between the poet and the and the engineer. The poet is marginalized. is outside. Is the utopian. Is someone who has nothing to do with the reality of the world. And the engineer is. Uh, 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 scotomized, separated uh, uh, from the, uh, the, the, from meaning, from the ability to, to search meaning. So, um, you see, um, I forgot about the question, but I, I am trying, no, the question was about uh, uh, the poet. The poet is, uh, is someone who is looking for the rhythm. What is rhythm? Felix Guattari speaks in his last book, Cosmos, uh, speaks of the present age, actually, he was writing this book 25 years ago, but he was seeing the future. So he speaks of, of late modernity as uh, the age of the cosmic uh, spasm, the spasm. And you know what is a spasm. The spasm is a sort of uh, painful, acceleration of the bodily rhythm. When your body is uh, uh, sort of going too fast or uh, the muscles uh, are moving too fast, this is uh, 
the spasm. We are living in the age of spasm, but this spasm is cosmic. And what does it mean? What is the cosmosis? In the Guattari uh, parlance, cosmosis is the ability to find an osmosis, a rhythm, a, a, a rhythmic relation, a symphony in the chaos is the ability to go beyond chaos, uh, being friends of the chaos uh, itself. So I think that the poet is someone who is able to find uh, the rhythm, the good rhythm, the happy rhythm, the symphony between our body and the chaotic uh, reality of our time. Um, we, we, we will never get free from the effects of 500 years of capitalism. Uh, we can be able to create uh, a new osmosis uh, in relation with the effects of uh, of uh, the age of capitalism, come out, uh, coming out from the corpse of capitalism is dead. It's so clear, but we uh, are unable to come out from the corpse of capitalism. This is our present uh, problem. And uh, in a sense, the only way to come out from the corpse uh, is to understand that uh, the corpse can be useful that we can do something with the corpse of capitalism. The point is, how can we find a rhythmic relation with it? The poet is the person who can, we can answer this question. OK, there was a question back there, and then here maybe. Um, you spoke a lot about how impotency defines our age, and and how we're um, and how we're sort of entering a dark age. Um, do you think that impotency and powerlessness is sort of a symptom of the end of history, whether that's in Fukuyama sense or Hegel's sense or Marx's sense? monolingual translation. <laughs> um, you have used the word powerlessness, uh, which is not the same that impotence in my vision. Um, you know, powerlessness, uh, those who have no power may be very powerful sometime uh, when, when they find a way to solidarity. Actually, the revolutions of the past and the, the, the revolution that we need now are based on solidarity among powerless people. Impotence is the inability to transform our powerlessness into a process of transformation, of emancipation from the, the bad effects of powerlessness uh, um, itself. Does the present impotence has the, have something to do with the end of history? Uh, if I understand uh, well uh, your question. Mm, well, I don't know exactly uh, what uh, the word me history means, because I, I remember a guy that uh, 25 years ago, Mr. Francis Fukuyama, uh, a respectful, in uh, a respectable uh, intellectual and uh, an interesting writer, eh? he spoke of uh, the end of history. He was speaking about the end of Hegel, in a sense. But also, you know, Americans never really understood about Hegel. Hegel is, is, the, is too, um, too European, too German, uh, too anti-Puritanical, in a sense. Uh, so um, when Americans uh, hear the, words to, the word totality, they translate it into globality or um, universality and so on. So what is the meaning of the word History. In the Hegelian sense, history is the process that leads to the aufhebung, to the 
final realization of truth, from the final liberation of Geist, of spirit, from the materiality of, uh, um, of the body. Well, this uh, kind of history is over. It has never existed, in fact. Uh, it has been a sort of hallucination of the romantic <coughs> mind uh, in, in, uh, in the age uh, of uh, uh, in the full age of modernity. So yes, history is, is over because it has never existed. But if you think uh, to history as the, the relation between chaos and I will not use the word order, between chaos uh, and uh, syntony, and, uh, and syntonic rhythm, if you think that uh, history is the unfolding of possibilities, uh, well, history is not over. History is in full swing. Not only history is in full swing because I see that uh, that war and violence and uh, and uh, uh, um, complexity of uh, uh, evil is everywhere, but also because the 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 the, the possible liberation from that is. Uh, is uh, here, is inscribed in the present. So, um, history, um, history is, uh, is, uh, is futurability. And actually, what, what, what is the meaning of the word futurability? <coughs> futurability is exactly this, the understanding that there is no one future. I've been uh, sort of paralyzed for 40 years uh, by those words uh, uh, of uh, the, the Sex Pistols, of those Londoners, uh, who 40 years ago, when I was a young man, uh, declared the end of something, the end of future. But future cannot be, cannot uh, end because it's, uh, it's a non-existing thing. The future is in our expectations, uh, is in our delusions and illusions and so on. Futurability is the good uh, word if you want, because futurability means the plurality of the possible. And the plurality of the possible is here, notwithstanding, notwithstanding depression, notwithstanding inevitability, notwithstanding war, notwithstanding impotence. Impotence is, uh, is uh, the, the depressive illusion that is uh, invisibilizing, is making invisible the possibility. And you, you say in the book that that um, that it's plural, but it's not infinite, and I think this is yeah. really important. Yeah, it's different from Negri, I think, in that sense. There was a, a question here, and then Bridget, and then here. Can I? Ah, oh. I already put the microphone. Oh, you did. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. we have three more here. Can I see your watch? Before, just to see. No, your watch. <laughs> <laughs> I see how we're doing for time. Oh, okay. Almost there. Um, okay. Well, you talked about the growing sense of knowledge as a way of um, of going out, or like, or the way to go towards the possibility. Um, and you talk about knowledge as a replacement of labor uh, with activity. And I was thinking about uh, what kind of knowledge were were you referring to? Because um, I was thinking how uh, knowledge, or like how education, is getting. Um, or critical thinking is getting more and more difficult nowadays um, with the privat privatization of education and also um, the functionalization of education um, we are living today. So, well, my question is, is uh, what kind of knowledge were you thinking about or what's your opinion um, on this? Does it, does it make sense to gather a couple of questions just Maybe. because we're getting a little, a little bit short of or short yeah. of time? Is that okay? Could we bring? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. So here, thank you. 
knowledge, what kind of knowledge the university? Uh, hi, thanks. My question is just about um, the one of the literal meanings of impotency and about sexual desire and about um, maybe there's a kind of uh, parallel to salaried labor in uh, sexual activity or as, as only procreation as opposed to pleasure and what might be a, a place for uh, desire without a specific uh, instrumentalized future at the end of it as a political way of playing around. Can you hack one more? Yeah, uh, Bridget. I wanted to ask if you could say a little bit more about the third category, power, which I think you said was a machine for invisibilization. Was that right? Um, and uh, so I'm interested here to hear a bit more about this kind of notion of distang you, you spoke then about distangling knowledge um, from the superstition of the salaried labour and of course immediately I thought there of something like Negri's reverse ascesis or um, and I wondered then about the the relation of that to the sensible which and to empathy which would be necessarily a kind of re-entanglement um, so I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about that please. So I, I tried to answer uh, two questions about uh, knowledge and about power, then I come to sex. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, uh, what is knowledge? My brutal answer is knowledge is a tool for laziness. Human beings started to be um, uh, knowledge, know, knowing people uh, when they understood that the more you know, the less you have to work. That is the point. The problem is that uh, things have, have become complicated at a certain point of history because uh, in the, in the modern time starts uh, with uh, a, an assertion of, of an English uh, philosopher who said that knowledge is power. And this is a, a, um, an ambiguous sentence uh, because uh, it means two different things uh, simultaneously. One, I would, uh, I would disambiguate uh, the Bacon's expression saying that one, knowledge is potency. Potency that makes possible the possible, that actualizes the possible. Second, knowledge is a force for entangling the possibility. So what is a tangle? Uh, a tangle is a grid of invisibilization. Um, in, I mean, uh, a, a tangle is a sort of organization of the field of existence, of activity, of social, uh, of the social field, is an organization that makes uh, possible to see something, but at the same time makes impossible to see something else. And uh, what is possible to see? That if you want to survive, you have to work. This is visible, uh, but at the same time, uh, the organization of knowledge makes, uh, and the organization of power, makes impossible to, to see the other part, uh, the other side of the moon, that uh, actually, thanks to knowledge, thanks to technology, uh, in, uh, survival is possible outside of the necessity of labor. Um, so, what is knowledge? Knowledge, like technology, like automation, is an ambiguous field in which the possibility is there, but at the same time, the social organization, the capitalist organization of uh, knowledge, is making impossible to see the, the possibility 
and is, is making impossible to, to develop the, the potency which is, able, which is able to actualize the possibility. And so, in a sense, um, um, the tangle is essentially a gestalt. In the, in, the, in the precise uh, uh, sense uh, of the German Gestalt theory, Kohler, Kafka, Wertheimer, those German psychologists uh, who uh, um, uh, described the process of vision uh, in an interesting way. They said, uh, when I see something, uh, actually, a flow of photons, of visual matter, is coming from the environment towards my eyes. But uh, I do not see a bottle. I see a, a flow of, of, of photons, of uh, visual matter that is coming from this object. But at the same time, my brain is creating a gestalt uh, as a gestalt uh, 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 that is built in my brain thanks to experience, thanks to communication and so on. So I see a bottle. This is a bottle for me. But uh, this possibility of seeing the bottle makes it impossible to see many other things that uh, are uh, 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 um, as real as the bottle itself. So when we, uh, in, when we look at the social reality, we see something which is the effect of a physical process, of a physical flow, but is also the effect of a, of a mental a gestaltization of, uh, of the vision, getting out from the gestalt, this is the problem. But in order to get out from the capitalist get gestalt, that is obliging to, to see labor in what is activity, that obliges to see salary in what is uh, uh, the relation uh, um, with nature. And uh, in order to come out from this gestaltization, entanglement of the gestalt, uh, we need a potency. And this potency, I come to sex at this point, uh, this potency is essentially based on empathy. And uh, empathy has obviously something to do with desire. And the desire has obviously something to do with the technical linguistic conditions of our exchange, with the technical conditions of our linguistic exchange. So I recently read a book of a German um, a, a psychologist and sociologist called the Spiegelhalter. The title of the book is Sex by Numbers. According to Spiegelhalter, uh, uh, it's difficult to, to, to make uh, statistics about sex, obviously. Uh, but he has tried to do to do that. And uh, he says, I, I have um, made lots of, uh, um, of um, inquiries uh, asked to people this and that and that. And uh, this is my conclusion. My conclusion is that in the 90s, uh, people of all ages uh, worldwide were making love five times every month in the 90s. In the, in the first decade of the new century, people of all ages worldwide were making love four times every month. In the second decade of the century, people are making love 2.5 times <laughs> every month. Something has happened. 
probably Spiegel Alter is uh, fantasizing, is crazy, but he uh, is teaching something at the Columbia University of New York, and the team that has uh, helped him to write the book uh, is a team of the Columbia University. So something um, meaningful is there. And also, I remember a book of Jonathan Crary <laughs> titled 24 slash seven about the disappearing of sleep. According to Jonathan Crary, American people or um, British people, I don't know, he's a British. Uh, uh, anyway, Western people were sleeping 10 hours per, per night at the beginning of the, of the past century. People were sleeping eight uh, and a half hours per night in the year 68. And people are sleeping six and a half hours now. Uh, I don't know how Jonathan Crary knows that. Probably is an invention, but it, uh, it speaks volumes about what is happening to our desire. And it has something to do with the reality of precarious job or precarious labor precarious life of, of the disappearing of, of empathy. Um, I have no answer uh, for, uh, for, this, uh, for this question. Just uh, I, I refer what Jonathan Crary and Andreas Spiegelarter have taught to me. And I wonder, probably the political problem of our future uh, has to be has to be solved starting from from how many hours do you sleep tonight <laughs> amazing thank you i think we probably have to finish there do we rosalie yeah, yeah 10 past eight okay so just really want to say a big thank you to Bifo. that was amazing um, thank you so much available <laughs> Outside. Okay, the book, the book is available outside and I think we're just going to go to the coffee shop for a drink now if anybody wants to join us and has more questions. So, thank you.